we go. I am recording this. So this seminar will eventually, as with the last one, go, I'm going to put it up on my YouTube channel. So a uh, huge shout out, special thanks to Kidder Trading Post for the support on this and for the 20% off coupon code, which they have given you uh, so graciously. And that is going to be uh, somewhere in this presentation. I'll give that to you a little later on. And that will be good for, I can't remember how long, but I can find out if anybody has questions, but a couple of weeks anyway. So you can get 20% off most everything uh, in their store. Well, not most everything, but uh, Stephen Clay, I was in Moultonboro Bay area. Okay, let's get going here. So I'm going to just talk a little bit about white perch in general for those that are new to white perch fishing. Uh, and, uh, and I want to start out by saying I've, I've seen a couple of comments over the past few weeks since I put this together of people who refer to white perch as like their nemesis and, and things like that. And I just want you to know that I totally relate to that. When I was a kid, my dad and I would catch white perch in the boats, in a boat or a canoe or kayaks or, or canoes, not really kayaks, but uh, open water and knew right where to go to find them. We never targeted them through the ice. And when I started fishing on Winnipesaukee, white perch was my nemesis too. I struggled. I struggled so much that I became obsessed about learning everything I possibly could about white perch and, and specifically their winter and spring behavior. So uh, if you're struggling and you, you watch these seminars and you still go back out and struggle, just keep at it. And when one day something will click and I can't tell you what that will be, but you might not even realize what it is, but one day something will click and all the pieces will be put together and you'll just get it and you'll be able to go out and, and find them, you know, almost at, at will. Anyway, white perch are brackish water species. They originally got into um, the Great Lakes when they constructed the Erie Canal and ships were passing through into the Great Lakes, Great Lakes and they were released in um, ship's ballast when they would release the water from their ballast. There would be white perch or white perch eggs in that. And that's how they originally got into or believed to have originally got into fresh water. And then, you know, lots of forms of dispersal, but bucket biology, uh, illegal transportation and, and uh, stocking is believed to be one of the largest factors of uh, white perch movements. They don't, um, I read one study that they don't really believe too much about like, you know, they say sometimes like crappies and bass and bluegills, uh, eggs will get stuck on the wings of like ducks or the legs of feet of ducks. And then they move them from one body to another. They don't believe that that's very much of a factor with white perch because of how quickly the eggs hatch. So they're not even in there very long. Um, in Winnipesaukee, we have a uh, pound and a half to two pound average fish. Two pound is on the upper side of average. And lately, and I'll get into this uh, here in a little bit, in a minute here, um, the average size is down a little bit. I believe it is down a little bit from what I'm seeing in our catches anyway. And we have caught uh, many three plus pound fish and they're not quite as common anymore as they used to be but they are they are pretty still pretty common and just to give you where's my pointer here i love this just to give you an idea that's the michigan state record that was set in 2015 it's two pounds uh, we caught two fish today that were bigger than that so, and these are 3.1 and 3.3 uh, pounds. So just to give you an idea, this was a while ago, this was 2014, but we have some of the largest white perch in North America are in Lake Winnipesaukee. So why is that? Well, they're very successful breeders. Um, a large female can lay up to 300,000 eggs. It's about the average white perch, the average breeding white perch will lay about 150,000 eggs. Now, average, textbook average is uh, about seven to 10 inches. So ours are considerably larger. So they can lay as many as 300,000 eggs each. Those eggs hatch in two to four days. So and I've seen some studies that say a little bit less than that. So very, very successful. Um, very little um, egg predation and um, 
given the timing of the hatch and the fact that they um, the only predation that they have in general is when they're in the, in the small fry state, the juvenile stage, adults have almost no natural predators. Um, they are considered a pro prohibited invasive species in a lot of states like Minnesota considers them a prohibited invasive. You're not allowed to possess them at all, uh, mostly because during the walleye and white bass spawn, walleye and white bass eggs will make up 100% of the white perch's diet. So they don't want them out there and I can understand why. Uh, and there's only one known disease that affects white perch. So they're very successful, very low predation, very low disease rate. Uh, those are some of the co contributing factors. The size of Lake Winnipesaukee, the water quality and the forage base is our major factors in that as well. Um, in most waters, they average seven to 10 inches. They're about 12 to 14 inches in Winnipesaukee. Um, Squam, Winnesquam, Lake Wentworth has some big ones, but they're harder to find. Like there are a lot of lakes in New Hampshire that have some pretty good sized white perch. They live up to 17 years and a pound and three quarter white perch is about uh, around eight years old. So you think about that when, you know, we're catching those big three pounders uh, and, and I've certainly done it myself in the past of keeping those big three pound fish. Those are, you know, 15 to 17 year old fish. So I, I try to keep that in mind today when, when we catch those really, really big, you know, over two and a half pound fish, because these, this is what they're supposed to look like. And when they get to be three pounds, if you catch a lot of them, it's easy to believe like, eh, you know, what's keeping a limit of three pound fish going to do? Well, I'll tell you a little while what it's, what it's going to do. It's, uh, it does a lot. There's a hierarchy. Striped bass fishermen or women, you'll, you'll understand this. They school by size. White perch are actually the closest living cousin to the striped bass. Uh, they're both uh, temperate bass, Moroni family. And um, so they, there's a hierarchy. So they'll school by size. So if you get into a school of two pound fish, it'd be a lot of two pound fish. If you get into a school of two, pound and a half fish, you can generally find some bigger ones below the school or on the outside of the school, or the bigger ones will be the first ones that you'll catch because they're gonna capitalize on the first opportunity to bite before the rest of the school kind of lights up and decides that's food, I'm gonna eat it, and I'm gonna eat it before anyone else does. The bigger ones are kind of smarter, they'll see it as food and they'll grab it right away. So you either catch them right away, or if you can get through a school and get to the bottom, there will sometimes, a lot of times be bigger, um, bigger white perch on the bottom of that school. Uh, I already said all this. The spawn, the, the, the timing, the, the duration of the spawn is about uh, anywhere from 10 to 21 days. That depends on um, water temperature mostly. So there are, there are two factors that drive the white perch spawn, length of daylight and water temperature. Now, if we have a really, really, really late spring or, or cold spring and the water temperature doesn't warm up, those fish at some point are going to spawn anyway because the days are getting too long and they know that they have to get it done. And so if the water's too cold, the spawn won't be as successful. So that, that's one uh, cause of some of the cycles that we see on Lake Winnipesaukee. They're very successful fish. Uh, and here's the big, the big contributor right here is the smelt, the rainbow smelt. Rainbow smelt are very high in lipids, very high in fats, and their lipid concentration doesn't increase with size. So what's that mean? Um, well, I'll get back to that in a minute. You can, you can increase your lipid intake by eat, greater by eating smaller ones as opposed to eating, targeting the bigger ones because there's no, there's no um, um, advantage to eating the bigger ones and thinking that as they get bigger, their concentration of, of lipids, which is fats, which is energy is gonna increase. So, that's why when we're lake trout fishing in the fall, the lake trout are targeting, you know, pin smelt, little, little tiny ones, because they can eat more of them and increase their lipid intake. Because if the concentration doesn't increase, you might as well eat those smaller ones. You see, you can eat more of them. Um, so this is a study that I found. Um, this 2000 Journal of Great Lakes Research, they studied seven species of fish. And of all seven species, um, lipid concentration increased in size in all of those fish except rainbow smelt. So like I was saying, if you want to increase your lipid intake, you eat a lot of the little ones. And I'm not saying that they have so much that they have higher lipids, but because their concentration is the same, you can 
increase your lipid intake by focusing on the small ones because you can eat more. It's kind of like if, if a, you know, a chicken nugget is a regular chicken nugget is 50% lipids and a giant chicken nugget is 50% lipids. Well, I'm going to eat more of the little ones, uh, and hopefully increase my lipid intake, but there's a lot more of them as well. So the availability of food at that size is, is greater than it is on those bigger smelt. All right, here we go. This is my soapbox. So I almost always do a piece on conservation on my lake trout uh, seminars. And, and I've decided based on what I'm seeing over the past several years, past 15 years that, that specifically, that I'm gonna add a conservation piece to this one. And I decided to lead with it so we can get it out of the way. That way, if I, I piss anyone off, uh, you still have the whole rest of the seminar to get to, to calm down. I don't, I don't ruin it for you by ending on a, what could be a controversial note. I tried to be very um, matter of fact and, and less opinionated and, and more uh, based on what I've seen observations and, and, you know, overall fact. So one common statement, overfishing is going to wipe out the white perch. That is false. That is not true white perch are an invasive species, just like overfishing isn't going to wipe out the rock bass in Lake Winnipesaukee. It's not going to happen. Fishermen will never be able to remove uh, an invasive species from a water body on, based on fishing pressure alone. And you look at states like Clear Lake Iowa with the yellow bass and the amount of fishing pressure that those fish receive, still, you can't get rid of them. We're not ever going to get rid of the white perch. So, I, I hear this argument like, oh, you're going to overfish them and then they're, they're not going to be there. Well, they'll always be there. The trouble is, how big are they going to be? That's, that's the problem. Um, will overfishing impact the size of the fish or the size of the schools? Absolutely. That's the biggest impact that overfishing will have on white perch. I say this in my lake trout seminars too. White perch have genetics. So any of you trophy deer hunters that are watching this, you're gonna, you will relate to this. Genetics plays a huge role in the quality of trophy bucks in a piece of woods. And if you remove the top genetics, the top breeders in their prime, then what you're essentially doing is you're leaving the, de the less desirable bucks to breed. And that's what happens with white perch. If you leave the small fish and they don't have the genetics to grow big, eventually what you've done, because a lot, the majority of them will grow big that have the genetics you've, to take all those big ones out, you are going to change the gene pool of that fish, which is why brackish water ones are so stunted. Saltwater fish, saltwater white perch have uh, several natural predators, even as adults, striped bass being one of their main predators. So um, weak fish, striped bass, two of their top predators. So in saltwater, you don't see them get as big because their natural predators are much greater than there are in freshwater. In freshwater, we are the top predator of the white perch. So when it comes to the adults, we're the top predator in that, in that chain. So overfishing will definitely and, and does and has impacted the overall size of the fish. And, and we see it about every five to seven years, we'll see this bumper of really big fish or really big schools and the population increases of, of anglers increases and they go out there and they just hammer on these white perch indiscriminately. And the next thing you know, the next year people notice, oh, white perch fishing isn't that great. Must've been a bad spawn for them. Maybe it was, but you know, you can't deny that angler pressure. When you see what I see some days on Lake Winnipesaukee, especially in late March when the fishing is at its best, it's, uh, it's significant. So yes, uh, are they cyclic? Absolutely, they are cyclic. There are many, many, many factors that contribute to white perch or fish species, any wildlife species in general. Um, spawning success is, is probably one of the top factors. If they, if they have an off year with a spawn, like I was saying, where the water just doesn't warm up, then their spawn is going to be uh, not as successful. So that year class of fish, won't be as big. There'll be fewer of them. So that then you'll notice several years later, four or five years later, when those fish become breeding size or, or adults, you'll notice that there don't seem to be as many of them or there the schools aren't as big. Um, so the timing of the spawn, weather, and egg predation. There is there is a, a, a little bit of egg predation, but it's pretty low with um, with white perch and angler pressure. 
So if you've heard of the predator prey relationship, maybe you've heard of the lynx hair cycle. Lynx hair cycle is just uh, putting labels instead of predator and prey. Um, lynx is the predator, hair is the prey. So same thing, same exact thing. And if you look at the prey population, when the, when the white perch population goes up, what happens? The word gets out, right? The internet's huge, Facebook groups and some forums, I guess, are still alive and active. And people talk about it. Um, big crowds are seen. And a lot of these places where the white perch move into uh, later in the winter are near public roads, major roads. That lots of traffic goes by. Lots of anglers can just drive by and they see everybody out there. They know. But the internet is a, is a big one. I'm not saying that all oh, the internet is, is ruining the fishing because um, the internet doesn't do anything without the people in it. So it's not the internet that's ruining anything. And I don't really believe that anything's getting ruined. It's just impacted. So we are the predators. So the, the uh, white perch population goes up. The size of the fish might be bigger. The size of the schools is bigger. They're in thick. Word gets out. Right behind it follows the predator relationship, the anglers. The anglers go out there. There are more people fishing for them and because their fishing is really good. And the word got out. Giants, you know, in Winter Harbor. And now there's 50 people out there every day pounding on these fish. And this, you know, this is obviously over years. This is, you know, not just per season. And then they start to impact them. And then the, the white perch population is, starts to come down. So you'll see them come down. Then it dips down, you get into a trough. And, and the anglers think, ah, the white perch fishing isn't that great. And fewer people are targeting them. That gives the white perch a chance to rebound in, in addition to whatever natural factors are contributing to their, their cycles. It's not all. Uh, predators, just like it's not all, um, you know, weather or, or spawn related. And so, and that, that's the cycle. So um, I, I think we're in a little bit of a down, you know, 2014 was probably an, a, a peak, definitely was a peak. That was, that was a really, really good year. And, um, and then about, five years later, 2019 was another really good year. It wasn't like 2014, but it was another really good year. I think that was kind of a bit of a peak. And then, you know, the pressure gets really high and, and that those fish start to kind of decline a little bit. And the fishing hasn't been amazing. It's been, you know, good in spots, but you know, when I say amazing, I mean, you can go to any known white perch spot on the lake and just catch white, per white perch all day long in March. Last year, the fishing ended a little, a little early. The ice fishing ended a little bit early because we lost the ice. But there's still that spring bite. And they get, an, I don't know if you've ever driven by um, like the uh, Lakewood Dam or Pier 19 when the white perch are running in the spring when they're spawning, they get a ton of pressure in the springtime. So it's not just, I'm not blaming ice fishermen. Uh-oh. Here we go. We still live. That was weird. All right. Anyway, I'm not, I'm not blaming ice fishermen. I don't want it to sound like I am. I'm just going to wait for this to catch up and make sure we're still good. Okay. Anyway, that's that. So I, I do believe conservation plays a big part in it. You know, I, if there are 100 people or even 20 people in one bay, I don't know what's going on with my computer. But it keeps fading out on me. So if there are, are you know, a bunch of people catching a limit of white perch every single day, it, it can't not have an impact. So to say that there are enough of them, we can do it it's fine is just being naive or um, not wanting to admit the truth. I don't know why this keeps black and out on me. Anyway, so where do I look for them? Uh, basins is one of my, one of my favorite places. I generally look for white perch in basins um, during the middle of the day when they're not as actively feeding. They will, they will go into the basins and just kind of hang out in the middle of the day after they've done their morning, their morning feeding. So um, basin hopping is, is a really 
really uh, favorite thing for me to do. You know, we'll, we'll go to a place early, maybe a, an inside turn or something. And then, and then we'll basin hop the rest of the day and then try to catch the evening bite again. And those are what I call the resident fish. They kind of go into that basin. They just kind of live there for the day. And then maybe they wait for a school of smelt to come over, you know, and, and then they'll just kind of hang out in there. And then inside turns, people always ask me, what is an inside turn? Um, and so I made this little add on. This is an inside turn, inside turn here, you know, you're inside here. An outside turn would be like this here, which is basically an underwater point. Inside turn is like an underwater cove. Uh, I love inside turns, especially when the white percher are on the move and either looking for food or feeding. They will try to push bait. They'll come in there looking for smelt or they'll try to push smelt in there. And uh, it's really, really uh, one of my favorite places to target the white perch. Uh, and funnels, uh, you know, they travel corridors. It's just like deer hunting. You know, they, they, they don't like to go up and over things. When they, once they get a desired depth for that day or that time of day, based on you know, barometric pressure and, and, and um, amount of available light, they will pick a depth that they wanna be at and they'll stay at that depth. And if that depth is 30 feet, they're gonna follow this contour. They're not, gonna, they're not gonna come up here and go over. They're gonna come up here and go around and they will do that. And so they'll, they'll I hit these travel corridors. They're really, really effective. Right. Oh, my power cord is plugged in. I'm not sure why I was doing that. Okay. Um, so Navionics. I, I talk about Navionics a lot because I use Navionics a lot. I use it on my phone. I use it on my computer at home when I'm looking for new spots and um, heading out, you know, the next day or whatever. And I, and I want to check out some new territory or, or um, you know, we get into a, a slump. Um, guiding and the fish just don't seem to be there or there's a lot of pressure and they kind of move out because fishing pressure will push the fish out eventually and uh, looking for new places I'll use the Navionics um, but so I have the boating app on my phone I can you know, use the GPS function you know if you don't have a you know I put my Helix 9 on my snowmobile but if you don't have a machine and you don't have a fish finder on it you can use the boating app which is you know $15 and it's all like you know gives you constant updates and you can hit the um, sonar charts layer here and zoom in. It will give you one foot depth contours, really pretty accurate as far as what you're going to see. Um, you can mark waypoints. You can use the track feature, which is always on my, on my snowmobile so we can see where we've been. So that way if I cross some sketchy areas like a pressure ridge and I, and I want to know how to get back or if it's dark, I can just follow the track back to where I started if I need to. And then the web app. Uh, is an excellent scouting cool tool and it's not called the web app anymore but if you google Navionics web app the the new chart viewer I think it's called Navionics chart viewer that will that will come up flashers uh, I will not go white perch fishing without a flasher unless I'm in an area where I'm fishing with tip-ups but if I'm jigging for them I am definitely going to have a flasher with me because I get to see everything. I can see everything. I can see the depth. I can see my jig. I can see the fish or no fish. Um, I can see the, the density of the bottom that my Vexilar will, will tell me whether it's I'm on a hard bottom or a soft bottom. And somewhat tell me the size of the fish. It will tell me the mood of the fish or how they're reacting to my jig. If they come in really fast. Are they really hungry? Is there a big school of them? Where's the top of that school? Because you want to keep your jig above the, above the school, not down in them or down below them. So, you know, it's a really fast and easy way to, uh, to gather that information when a school of fish does come in or when there's no fish and you, you know that nothing has swam by in two hours, it's time to go somewhere else. Uh, some of my favorite lures, we'll get into that. These are uh, probably my top three would be the epoxy drop. Um, and then the blade spoon, I use the I like the, the white, or they call it silver tiger, eighth ounce on a, on a sunny or a brighter day. And then on a really cloudy overcast or snowy day, I'll, I'll use the, the pink one or red glow, uh, red glow tiger. I believe it's called red, red glow tiger. And they make one that has gold flake on one side of it too. And then this uh, eighth ounce pinhead minnow. 
Now you'll see this one doesn't show a treble hook. I've just kind of erased the treble on both sides because you cannot bait treble hooks in New Hampshire through the ice. So you can either clip two of the points off your treble or you can buy a size six so wash, I believe is what I, what I put out on mine. It's a single hook so I can put a little piece of worm on there. And I pair them up uh, when I'm fishing with the epoxy drop. Uh, I'll fish a 28 inch. Uh, I like the Jason Mitchell, uh, the Gen 8 rods. I fished the Gen 7s and then when they came out with the Gen 8s, they kind of upgraded them there. Pretty nice upgrade. They have kind of like a sort of like a wind grip handle and they're really comfortable, really, really nice rods. Uh, I'll fish that 28 inch three pound test. I, now you don't need to go this heavy, but because we do catch a lot of lake trout that will come in and even eat that epoxy drop and so, some days, especially that epoxy drop, uh, I do beef it up a little bit. I run three pound test line and uh, on a 28 inch rod. Uh, this is them here. The, and then the, with the blade spoons, I, I run the 30 inch. I really like this 30 inch rod, especially when the lake trout hits. All right, there's our coupon code, PERCH20. Uh, there are some limitations and, and I'll, it's a long list of limitations. Most of it won't apply to, to ice fishing. It's clothing and, and certain, certain manufacturers um, need to authorize sales, which is why there are so many limitations. It's not Kittery being cheap. It's the fact that they need permission to run these specials and they don't, they don't you know, they can't get it for just a, a quick, um, ice fishing sale, you know, for certain clothes, but it's, it's mostly clothing and, and some hiking and very, very limited on the fishing end of things. So Perch 20 will get you 20% off your purchase. You can go in, you can go in and pick it up. Or you can do curbside. I think they're still doing curbside pickup there. So shout out to Kittery. Thank you very much for that. And tip up fishing. Um, maybe I'll stop for some questions after this. Um, there's been some confusion over the years about whether or not I fish tip-ups. We'll have some clients that will attend my seminars and sometimes they show up and they see me pull out the tip-ups and they're like, what's going on? And, you know, we're allowed two lines and some days, and I found this through guiding, uh, that's, that's actually the current North American fish, freshwater fishing hall of fames, ice fishing tip-up world record. Yeah, say that 10 times fast. Um, over the years, we found that there are days when the white perch will not touch the jig. They just ignore it. They come in and look at it and they ignore it. And that's actually been the last few days for the most part, but they will eat live smelt. And then there are other days when they, they'll pass right by the smelt and they're just triggered by the movement of the jig bouncing up and down, or you get a school to come in and we'll pull the tip ups out because they'll eat those too, but they're much more fun and much more effective as far as catching more fish when you're using a jig rod. But for being able to spread out and cover a big area, that's where tip ups come in handy. You can cover a lot more water, but you're less mobile. It's more like dropping an anchor and then you got to have to pull your anchor if you want to move. Um, but when those fish are keyed in on smelt, it's really, really effective. My tip ups, uh, I run these, these trophy thermal tip ups. I really like them. They're 10 and a half inches. So they'll fit over a 10 inch hole. They're insulated. They have the little tackle box with, you know, line markers. And I think there's some split shots and hooks in there. They come with a sounder. I, I like that they fold down and they store in a five gallon bucket. You can put five of them in a five gallon bucket. bucket. I like that. Um, it's just my preference. And then you can, you can see the, the little um, flag trip spinning when the, when the fish is taking line. So if, if it's not spinning, you know, you can just leave it and you don't, you can see it from a distance. You can see how fast it's spinning. And I tell my clients that they want to approach this tip up. Uh, they want their speed to kind of match the speed of the, of the spool as it's going out. If it's not really going out very fast or not going out at all, you don't have to go, but if it's screaming run. Uh, I put 18 pound tip up line, then I run a swivel. And on that, I tie six pound, about 10 feet of six pound fluorocarbon leader. They start out at 10, but lake trout teeth over time, they get the hook down deep. You know, you're I'm constantly cutting four to six inches off at a time or three inches off at a time to get rid of those nicks in the fluorocarbon. And they run a size eight um, hook. I've been using the Gamakatsu octopus. And then I just started using some owner mosquito hooks, which uh, I like, I like those. And I run them for white perch. I run them, I start about three feet off bottom. If they don't seem to be hitting them and we're marking fish on Vexilars, 
I may drop it down on a bright sunny day and I'll put it a foot off bottom. I don't like to run my white perch lines, my baits that close to the bottom, just because there are a lot of little humps and waves on the bottom of that lake and you can get it down behind those and the fish can swim right by it. To get it up three feet off the bottom, it's a pretty safe bet that they're going to be able to see it from a distance. And, and if they want to eat, then, then they can at least see it and make that decision. All right, let's see, take some questions here, just a couple. Aaron asked, how can I tell a hard or soft bottom really quick? Uh, well, with the Vexilar, you look at the band on the bottom that marks the bottom. If it's a big, big, wide red band, that's a really hard bottom. If it's a smaller red band and maybe has a little bit of green on top, that's a, or orange, that's a soft bottom. And if, if there is a lot of green stacked up on top of the red, no, those are probably weeds. So you're, you're, in a, you're in a weedier or a softer bottom. That's the best way to tell with the Vexilar. And inside corners, hopefully that slide there answers that for you, Aaron. That is an inside turn. Think of it as an underwater, a cove underwater. And sometimes they're big and sometimes they're not very big, but it's a, it's a flat bottom here and it's real steep sides and it comes in. So those fish will kind of, will push in there. That is an inside turn. Uh, hey, Adrian. Hey, Jack. Let's see. Uh, how do I hook smelt on tip ups? I hook the smelt just in front of, just barely, like right at the front edge of their dorsal and right just a little ways down. You can't go too deep on the smelt because you'll spine them uh, just barely uh, under about halfway between the black. You can see their spine through them, they're pretty translucent. All right, I'm gonna keep right on rolling here. And we'll talk about jigging cadence. So I generally like a, a, a short, quick cadence. What I tell my clients is imagine tapping on glass and uh, Jeremy, if you just go back, I already covered lure size and color. Um, so you can, you can go back. I'm not gonna spend too much time um, going back on stuff because it's, it is a lot to it. But I, I tell people that to picture tapping on a piece of glass, tick, tick, tick. That's all you're doing. And that's what I'm doing right there. That's pretty much my jigging cadence and I will move it up, work the jig up and I'll work the jig back down. And once in a while, I'll give it a rip, but I'm just tap, tapping glass, tick, tick, tick. And that's my jigging cadence for the most, most part. When the fish come in, if they're chasing it, I'll, I'll work it up and I'll, and I'll, but I keep that jigging cadence going just like that. And that's pretty much my go-to cadence. Um, I don't use wax worms, Jeremy. I, I use a um, piece of dilly or um, spikes, maggots. And uh, the, when I put the dilly on, I put just enough to cover the hook. I think I, I should go into that here in a couple of slides. But if not, I will. I will cover that. Uh, play that keep away game. Make them chase it. Don't let them get a look at it. And just, just kind of play on that, that predatory instinct. Uh, and pounding bottom works really, really well. This is a, a pretty popular lake trout technique. You can also do the same thing with white perch. If they're finicky in the middle of the day, excuse me, if you're fishing in a basin, sometimes there will be fish uh, a little ways away from you that won't come right in. But if you pound bottom, sometimes that's just, that's the, that's the magic that, that it takes to get one to come over. If there's a school of fish in there and they're negative and they don't want to bite, and you can get one of those fish to bite 90% of the time that whole school is going to bite because they just can't, they get into a frenzy and they just can't, they can't help themselves. Um, yeah, no worries, Jeremy, that the info is there though. You can go back um, once the video is done and it's, it's just, it's a few slides that talks about lures and colors and, and all that. 
um, the bite during the spawn. The bite during the spawn is very good. And you'll know when they're spawning because they'll be lined up on the shores uh, in their spawning areas. Alex asked, how long will I fish a non-productive hole before I move or how far will I move to the next hole? Um, um, it really depends on, no, it depends on a few things. My mood, if I feel like moving, I'll move a lot. If I don't feel like moving, you know, these days when I get a chance to go out and just fish, I, I, sometimes I just want to relax and I don't feel like moving. So I'll just sit in the same place for, you know, an hour or two, but when I'm really fired up and I'm really running and gunning and, and searching for those fish, uh, because I know they're there and we just can't seem to find them that day. I'll move every you know, 35 minutes, 30 to 30 minutes to an hour. It really depends. And if I get into a, it depends on the areas that I'm looking. If I'm basin hopping, I will start on one side of the basin, up the side of the basin a little bit, and I'll work my way in a, in a cross pattern. I'll go all the way across that basin and up the other side a little bit. I'll start in the middle and I'll go back and forth both ways. And I'll kind of just cut that into that basin into four sections. If I don't get any fish to go, then I move on to the next basin. So however long that takes me, some basins are bigger than others. And sometimes you'll get a fish to come in and you'll spend a little more time working a fish and it may it turn out to be not a white perch or it's just one by itself. So it really depends. If I don't see anything and I'm out in, and I'm in search mode, then I will uh, move along in you know 30 minutes if I'm by myself. If I'm guiding, I'm generally setting tip ups. And so we spend a lot longer in an area than normal. And there's another factor though, is that, is that I watch I watch the other anglers around me. And I'm not looking to go over to their spots. I just want to know if if we're not catching, and I watch another party that is, then I know that it's either the location or something that I'm doing. And I'll try to change what I'm doing first and before I change location. But if I look around and I'm I spend three hours watching everybody fishing around me and nobody's catching anything. And I have friends that are out and they're texting me that they're struggling too. I know that the bite is just off and I won't, I won't move as much, especially when I'm guiding clients, because if you spend 30 minutes moving, it's 30 minutes. You're not fishing. That's 30 minutes that you've missed the opportunity to, to catch fish and to, to, for what, to move to another spot. That's just as productive. You might as well just stay where you are and hope that a, a you know, a roaming school or a few fish come by, catch what you can catch, you know, maximize your opportunities. Uh, thank you, Ryan, for tuning in. Okay, here we go. So the bait and the bite. I fish worms or spikes, and I put just enough worm. So I thread the worm, a piece of dilly, onto my hook, pinch it off, just enough. If there's anything hanging off of that hook, white perch are, are fabulous at, at picking it off and pulling that bait right off. So uh, just enough to cover the hook. And if I'm using spikes, you, you go to the fat end, and you just squeeze them just a little bit to make that the fat there's a pointed end and a rounded fat end. You squeeze it, make that fat end kind of bulge a little bit, and then you can hook it right in there. And there's a clear liquid that's actually a natural natural fish attractor in the spikes. Uh, I fish dillies most of the time just because it's easier and the bait lasts a long time, and you can bait you know three or four or five times with one dilly, and they're they're smaller. So if you do um, only bait a couple times with one dilly. I don't throw them back in the container. So um, you're not wasting quite as many as you would if you were using full-size crawlers. The bite is subtle. The bite is very, very subtle. Part of the reason I play keep away with these fish is because a large white perch generally won't swim up and grab it and swim away with it like a small fish will. A large white perch is gonna swim up, close its mouth on your lure, realize it's not what it thought it was and open its mouth and release it. But if you're playing, so you won't even feel the bite. It's not going to be a thump. But if you are playing keep away and that fish comes in and I'm raising up and all of a sudden the fish grabs it, my rod loads up and I feel the weight and I know to set the hook. So it's, it's, it's one, it keeps them from, from getting a look at it. Two, it, it kind of keys in on their predatory instinct. But three, it allows you to feel the bites when they're really, really subtle. So play that keep away game. Um, 
David Gray, do I see more white perch in the northern part of the lake versus other parts? Yeah, I do. Yep. Um, probably from the middle of the lake up seems to have more white perch. Meredith Bay has good center harbor, uh, Moultonboro Bay, all the way up into Swissville and States Landing has a lot of white perch. I don't think they see them as much in Alton Bay. And when I was younger, I used to think it was um, the amount of people down there, but they move into bays like 19 Mile and Swissville and Meredith Bay and Center Harbor, which also get out, see a lot of people. So I don't think it's as much the people as it is um, the habitat and the, the um, waters for some reason are a little bit colder. For some reason they like it. It's a little bit cold. It can be a couple of degrees cooler in the north end of the lake. Uh, I'm warmer in the north end of the lake, sorry. Because in the fall before the lake freezes, cold water is more dense. So when the wind blows out of the north, it pushes that cold water south. So the southern end of the lake will have a little bit colder water than the north end. Eventually it stabilizes in the winter time, but early on that's the case. Yes, Aaron, crawlers will work if you can't find dillies, but like I said, you just, you waste more, but yes, they absolutely work. It's, it's a worm is a worm is a worm. So yeah. Uh, hey Mark, thanks for tuning in. All right. So when the fish move in, get that jig back down there. The more time you can have with a jig down there to keep their attention, the longer they'll stick around, especially if they're just moving through. Once they think they found a food source, they, they're more inclined to stick around. So if you're alone, this is another reason I, I beef up my gear just a little bit so I can get those fish up, and get my jig back down as quickly as possible. If there's a couple of you, then you've, you know, you've, you've got this going on. Some one person's fighting a fish, another person's dropping a jig down and, and you're back and forth. And there's always something going on down there to keep those fish around. So fishing with a friend is, is uh, not just fun. It can, it can be uh, really advantageous when it comes to um, the, when it comes to keeping a school there. When I get a school of fish that's six or eight or 10 feet deep and they're, they're coming up as soon as my jig gets two or three feet below the ice and you can see them coming up out of the school because they see it already and they're really that aggressive, I don't even bother baiting my hook anymore. I just get it down there and keep it moving and they'll eat a penny with a, with a hook in it if, if you drop it down there as long as it's, it's moving and they can get it in their mouth. So triggers, playing a keep away, triggers them, pounding bother will trip bottom will trigger them and sometimes the dead stick will trigger them some days you know the the last three white perch that have been caught on a jig rod by my clients this week were caught on a dead stick and they would jig it and the white perch would follow it up three or four feet off bottom and then go back down and if they just left it it would come in and it would just really subtly hit it and they they would uh they would catch those fish so the dead stick sometimes they're just they're negative and they don't want to chase and they get spooked. Maybe they're pressured. Um, who knows? You know, it's still early. The broads have only been frozen for a week. So the fish are just starting to move in from that highly oxygenated water that was previously open and they're starting to come up in. So they might be a little, still a little bit spooked. They might not have their feed bags on where, you know, those bays are kind of getting in, we're getting into that mid February period. So, you know, that's, that's technically or often uh, associated with kind of a, a bit of a slowdown. Create that frenzy, you get one to bite. Like I was saying, if you can trigger one, a lot of times the rest of the school just goes bananas and they just can't resist. And then, and then they're just trying to beat other fish to the lure. And that's what keeps them going. And that's what gets going. And those are the days that we don't see those all the time, but those are the days that I'm looking for. That's what I'm looking for every single time I go out is for those frenzies. I'm looking to find a big school of white perch uh, that I can trigger and keep around. Okay, I could feel like some days I could say this a thousand times to my clients and I look over and there's their jig six inches off the bottom down there because they see little flickers on the bottom of yellow perch or smelt and they, they, they just can't, they can't not do it. You gotta stay off the bottom. You can get down there and you can pound the bottom but then come right back up. Now I know there's always an exception to the rule and there will be days when you'll catch a lot of fish being down by the bottom but 99.5% of the time, you need to stay two or three feet off the bottom. Uh, keep it up where the fish can see it. Keep it up where the fish have to expend a good amount of energy to get to it if they want to take a look at it. That way, that fish is going to want to eat something. It's going to want to get something in return for all the work that it did, all the work, the work that it did. So it's they're more apt. The higher you can get them to go, the more inclined they will be to bite. Uh, 
Uh, okay. Brendan asked how many rods and jigs do I have ready when fishing? So I, I went through earlier all of my favorite jigs. I have a rod with each one of those on it. So three to four rods ready to go every time I go. So I'll have a rod with a pink blade spoon. I'll have a rod with a white blade spoon. I'll have a rod with a white epoxy drop and a white with a, and a rod with a silver and blue pinhead minnow, whether it's jointed pinhead or regular pinhead minnow. Um, I at least have one. So usually four, I usually have six rods with me, but rigged for white perch all the time. I usually have that, that those four combinations ready to go all the time. Um, when I go check a trap or take a break, I will I leave my jig at depth or reel it up? Do they get smart if it's sitting still and lose interest? Um, I do. I leave my. I do leave mine in the water. Uh, if I go, if I get a flag or I run, I. But I make sure I lay it on the ice. If you leave it up on a seat, in the in the shelter, they can pull it off the seat. But if it's down on the ice, they're going to have a harder time getting that whole rod down in the hole. If if a big fish did grab it, but I I generally lay my my rod right on the ice. I just leave it there. Um, you know, sometimes they'll hit it and set the hook. Sometimes they'll hit it and strip the bait and they don't generally get spooked by it but sometimes they'll just come in and it's not moving so they lose interest but you know i'm off checking a tip up so it's not that big of a deal if i'm going to be gone for a while i don't leave a line unattended um you know any any longer than to just like run real quick and, and check a line if i'm going to be you know any more than a minute or two i don't leave a rod laying on the ice because that's the same thing as leaving a tip up on the ice and, and leaving the ice uh, but if i'm just running outside sometimes or if we get a flag real quick i'll just say you know just throw your rod down we can see it, you know, if anything were to happen, uh, we can run right back over. We're not more than, you know, 50 yards away most of the time. Um, Dane, will the white perch eat a tikka minnow? Uh, I'm still waiting to find out. We haven't had any big schools come through, but I have my money on yes, they will. I, th I think the smallest of them is going to be a, a white perch killer. It's just a matter of we haven't been able to find those big schools uh, in the areas that we've been and a lot of that is so we've had some really sketchy ice so far and in, in, in large areas that have really really good ice and then a very small pocket in that large area that has really bad ice so it has me with my clients it has me not willing to move around as much because even though you see somebody over here and you see somebody over here there could be a place right up here real thin narrow strip you know there was a, a really thin narrow strip uh two weeks ago would be three weeks ago tomorrow that we were watching water ripple down through the a really thin probably 25 feet across by 100 feet long but it was open just a few weeks ago and it's a it's a, a thinner area so there were other areas like that springs and 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 some current and stuff so uh, we haven't been out looking as much as I would like to for uh, those big white perch, but when I find them, I'll let you know if they eat the tikka minnow. Um, I do, Mark Sawyer, I, I do not use a swivel ever when ice fishing with a fishing rod. I just, I don't like them. Um, they become a nuisance to me. They get reeled up into the guides and break or, you know, chip, chip guides. And so I just stay away from them and deal with the consequences of that. So I don't use, I just run three pound tests, monofilament. I use the frost ice line. It's really good stuff. And I just tie my lure right directly to that. All right, moving on here. Mobility is a huge factor. Now, I know not everybody can afford to go out and buy a nine or $10,000 snowmobile, but you can certainly get them a lot cheaper than that. It doesn't have to be rigged up like this one, but um, the more mobile you can be, the, the better your chances are uh, either on, on tough days when the fish aren't moving around, you can kind of go to them when the ice is, is decent. And so you stay as mobile as possible, right? More people means less mobility. That, that's how it kind of works for me as a guide. Um, but when those fish are feeding, they're on the move. So 
you can run and gun and chase those schools. You can run and gun in the middle of the day and, and hit basins and go from one basin to another. And that's where the Navionics chart viewer or the web app from home comes in really handy because you can look at an area on, of the lake that you know you can access that day if you're on foot. It's going to be a smaller area that you can cover if you're on a machine and you know where you're going to access from you know you can pick six or eight different basins and just go fish those six or eight different basins uh, and then kind of go from there if you if you strike out but mobility is huge a lot of the times but not always some days like late season um, when those fish are just cycling through their their breeding areas, their spawning areas, and they're just hanging in there all the time. You just got to wait for them to come back by. On super bright, sunny, or windy days, when those fish aren't really moving around, it really doesn't always, most of the time, it doesn't pay to go out searching for them. You might as well just wait. Uh, and like I said, I spend a lot of time watching other anglers, and I have friends that are out that are texting me or that I can text and find out how they're doing do a lot of homework about and to decide whether or not it's even worth moving. Some days it's worth just staying put and hoping that a school comes by or, or a few, you know, the last couple of days uh, we haven't seen any big schools. It's just been, you know, I think it's been smaller, smaller numbers that just kind of come through and you pick off one or two here and then it might be 30 or 40 minutes and then another one or two here in there. Um, so it's not always, this is rare. I know I just talked about conservation and people are probably looking at this. I'm sure there's somebody that's looking at this man like so much for conservation. This is rare. I have maybe a handful of clients that come every year who want to catch a limit of those handful. Maybe two of them do it. Maybe. Uh, if, if I keep a limit once a year, it's pretty rare. I generally don't, uh, I don't freeze much fish. Maybe in the spring, if I go up in my boat and I catch, you know, half a dozen or a dozen, I might freeze some then, but um, so you won't see a ton of pictures like this. We had one really good trip uh, where they caught almost a limit between two people, but those were, those were 10, 10, 11 inch fish. Those weren't these big giant jumbo breeders. So before anybody goes bananas, because I talked about conservation and they see that and they think I'm a hypocrite, well, maybe you still think that, but I just want to point out that this is pretty rare. So um let's see brandon asks what is my most important tip when fishing for whites that i would give someone hmm well let me come back to that brandon uh, alex says what's my favorite thing about being a guide um and was it difficult going through the process becoming a guide uh, my favorite thing about being a guide Geez, I don't know. It's a toss up between getting to spend every day on the water, but probably the people that I meet, I, I, I've um, come to really, really enjoy that. I meet a, a lot of different people from a lot of different backgrounds and a lot of different, you know, um, economic situations and careers and really just very interesting people. And uh, I feel like I learn a lot by um, spending a day on the on the ice or in my boat with uh, different people from you know it's kind of like being exposed to different culture almost but different you know uh all, different backgrounds of from of all all ranges that's probably my favorite thing about being a guide um it wasn't as difficult when i got my license as it is now now it is extremely difficult there is a very high failure rate and if you're thinking about becoming a guide i highly recommend that you go to the guide school one of the guide schools and take that class they'll teach you about the test because it's a written and an oral test and it's it's they don't mess around it's pretty tough um, activity on the ice does spook fish or push them away even wind uh, I, I found that that noise on the ice can push the fish out I prefer cloudy days over sunny any day. I love a cloudy day, but that doesn't mean that they're going to bite just because it's cloudy, but I certainly get excited and hopeful when I see clouds, clouds and calm. Sun and wind are the two things that seem to kill the white perch bite most of the time. There's always an exception to the rule. Do I think the color of tungsten plays a large role? Well, my tungsten is all painted, so it plays the same role that any other color jig is going to play. 
So, you know, I fish, you know, bright colors on bright days and more neutral and natural colors on, on cloudy days. So whites and pinks in Winnipesaukee because the water's so clear. Well, walking with crampons. No, when that won't really spook the fish when they're 25 to 40 feet down. Definitely not. Um, it, this isn't like trout fishing in super shallow water. Uh, but, you know, a lot of vehicles, you know, you get a typical Saturday in 19 mile bay and there's, you know, can be 25 vehicles and two of them are doing donuts and there's snowmobiles everywhere and ATVs everywhere. And, you know, the fishing sometimes can take a hit because of that. All right. So find those smelt uh, clouds of smelt. If you're marking clouds of smelt on, on your fish finder, that's a really good sign. And, and if you don't know what that looks like on a Vexilar, it will show up as lots of green lines. That's how it begins. Lots of little green lines. It looks like interference. And all of a sudden those green lines start to blend together and they turn orange and then they start to turn red. And eventually you have this big red band and then it goes backwards and it fades back out eventually as that school moves on. If you're seeing that a lot, you know, all day, you will get into spots sometimes where it's just like constant schools of smelt. There's just tons of smelt in it. That's a really good sign because eventually a school of fish is going to find those you hope and and they'll they will uh, and you'll be there waiting and you might have to drill all our holes that's that's just how it goes uh, on a slow day you're gonna have to drill a ton of holes because they're not gonna move very far to to investigate a jig some sometimes and you just have to drill a lot of holes and drop it right down in front of them where it's worth their time and effort to to go over there and check it and... all right so don't forget to check out my and subscribe to my YouTube channel if you haven't already. I was hoping to do more content, but it seems like every time I get a chance to go out and film, the weather's bad or something comes up, but, but I'm working on it. Um, so that's Timo Fishing on YouTube. And we have a Patreon as well if you're interested in that. It's uh, uh, patreon.com slash Timor Outdoors. And then uh, there's some pictures. We don't have any dates left this year for ice fishing but we do have a waiting list so if we get a cancellation which is pretty unlikely um, we can put you on the list to uh to add to that all right and now i'm gonna go back through these questions let's see mark sawyer do i tie directly to my jigs. I do. I do not use swivels. I tie direct to my lures. Uh, I'm still trying to do a pretty good job of monitoring all these questions as they were coming in. Uh, yeah. Do I ever film my clients? I haven't in the past, but I am going to see if about filming a few trips this year just to put something together just for the guide service. Um, I do have some video of some of my clients in the, in the past that have got into some insane uh, white perch fishing. But uh, I haven't put together like an entire YouTube video. Yep, I'll be out for the Derby. Ah, Brendan, thank you for reminding me. My most important tip. Jeez, that's a tough one. The most important tip for white perch fishing. Um, hmm. That's that's a tough one. There are there are so many pieces to that puzzle that I would I would hate to sacrifice. You know, you you, you got to stay mobile. I guess you got to you know you got to uh, do your homework. So you know you can figure out if the bite's even good in an area. Um, but stay mobile, I think is is probably going to be. It doesn't mean staying mobile doesn't mean moving all the time. Staying mobile means moving when you need to move. Moving if the if the fish if the bite is off and you need to move, then then staying mobile is going to allow you to do that. So don't spread your gear all all over the ice. If, if you use something, put it back. You know, generally when I'm out by myself, the only thing you'll see laying on the ice is going to be my Vexilar and and maybe a rod. Uh, 
Um, all right, we're winding down. All right, well, I'm going to thank everybody. This will, this will stay up so you can come back and watch it. If, if you missed some of it, you come in late, you can go back and watch this. As soon as I stop it, it will, it will uh, populate and then repost as a video. And I'm also going to put it up on my YouTube channel at some point. So I want to thank everybody for tuning in. I hope at least some of you found this helpful. And don't forget to check us out. Uh, like the Facebook page if you haven't already. And go subscribe to the YouTube the subscribers really helps me out a lot and it lets you know uh, if you hit that notification bell right next to it you'll get notified every time we upload a new video and we've, we've definitely ramped that up in the past year um, back to what it used to be and i hope to keep growing that channel and growing my ability to to get out and, and film more often uh, when the weather permits so yeah thanks everybody have a great night good luck out there uh, and please if you see me on the ice don't be afraid to come over and say hello, even if I'm with, with client clients. I love it when people stop and say hi. I mean, don't stay all day, but um, definitely come on over and, and say hello. Uh, I really, I love, I love meeting everybody. You know, I, I follow a lot of people on, on Facebook, but I don't really stalk a lot of profiles if, if I don't know you. So I might not even recognize you until you tell me who you are and then I'll, and then I'll know. So anyway, come on over, say hello, good luck, be safe. Listen, the Derby's coming up this weekend. And I just want to touch on safety. You know, I touched on it a little bit earlier that uh, the conditions of the lake, I'm pretty sure that the broads are not safe for machine travel. There's been snowmobiles through the ice every weekend for the last two weekends. I know we have some real good cold temperatures, but the entire lake is covered with fresh snow now. So be really careful out there. Don't use the, well, I see other people out there principle as your you know, as, as a way to go and don't, you know, do what some people do when they, they look for wet spots in the snow. And if they see a wet spot in the snow and they avoid it because um, there's enough snow now that it can hide a lot of those wet spots. But, so just be really careful out there, check as you go and, uh, and don't go anywhere that hasn't been traveled yet. You know, and if you only see one set of tracks going one direction, they're not coming back. Uh, I wouldn't, I don't know as though I would follow them. And you don't know how fast those, that snowmobile was going if you're following a snowmobile track. They could have been going 100 miles an hour and skip right across something that you can't at 30 or 40. So be really careful out there. Good luck to all everybody that's fishing the Derby. Um, I, I, I wish I could hope that you all win 15,000, but you can't all win it. So somebody's going to. And, and uh, hopefully it's me. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Good luck. Have a good night. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. And we'll, we'll see you on the next one.